All righty. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, and uh, f- final few people trickle in from the back. They'll trickle in from the back. Thank you all for uh, coming to attend our session. Um, you are a golden god. Automate your workflow for fun and profit. So a quick show of hands in the audience just so we can get a sense of who all we're talking to. How many of you have already automated at least some part of your workflow? All right. So this is my crew. How many of you would you say you've, you've got more automation you want to do? Okay, cool. And if I can have the next slide. This is the feeling of automation! It's amazing, right? We call it you are a golden god because it's just fucking awesome when you get robots to do your work for you and they eliminate the pain and the suffering and the drudgery of being a web developer and permit you to be the fullest flower of the genius that you are. Thank you. It's also a little better tempered with reality. When I had never seen the movie Almost Famous when Josh put the animated GIF on our talk. And I think that it does a fantastic job of capturing both the hubris and the delusion that helps us get started on our efforts for automation. <coughs> You've probably seen this XKCD if you are at all familiar with automation. And I would really encourage you to heed the alt text, and don't screw yourself. There are so many ways that automation can go wrong. And who among us has not actually had this exact thing happen? Like, as an engineer, as a developer, I will cop right now to having spent a factor of two, maybe even a factor of ten more time on the, like, automation system than actually it would have taken me to just do whatever the thing was that I was trying to automate in the first place. Anybody ever kind of looked back and seen that? Okay. Cool. So we're all in a safe space. We can talk about this together. It's okay. Um, and that, that is really what we're gonna what we're gonna talk about here. We're here to talk about like the high highs and the low lows, the, like the real peaks and valleys that come with trying to like augment your human capabilities with that of machines. You know, the Sorcerer's Apprentice is like a great metaphor for this. You like can chop the broom in half and get it to do the twice the work for you, but if it gets out of control or it's not well intentioned, you run into kind of a gray goo problem where the machines are running wild. And so uh, we're really here to try to identify and talk about and help everyone conceive of this notion of what I like to call appropriate automation. And it starts kind of with agile methodology. It does. Or ideology, I should say. Yeah, if you you read the the write-up, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is rooted in our understanding of agile ideology. Now, there are plenty of methodologies, XP, Scrum, Kanban, Scrumban. Scrumban? It's a thing. Um, So there, there are those. And there are all of the practices, retrospectives and user stories and velocity tracking that go along with Agile. And we have what I like to think of as the the, uh, development-driven set, the ABCDDs of Agile, if you will. There's ATDD, BDD, CI, CD, DDD, TDD, all of these ways and all of these things that people um, believe very strongly in. And I think in the Drupal community and other places where I've done consulting and worked with teams, that people experience it, um, it's a very loaded word with a lot of of baggage. And they experience it a little more like my buddy Chris, but doesn't Agile actually just mean twice as much done in half the time? Right. People tend to think it's just, oh, we're moving fast, more features faster, and that's not what it's about. It's yeah, like, it's kind of a trigger word like communism was in the 1950s. And like all good isms, it had a manifesto. It started here with the idea that we're uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. And through this work, we've come to value. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Working software over comprehensive documentation. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. And responding to change over following a plan. That is, while we value the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. So the context of this, I think, is really important. The Agile Manifesto was published in 2001. So that's, uh, I was thinking about the keynote this morning, that's a year after Drupal. IE6 had not yet been released. You could still wear your shoes through airport security. And if you Googled for Gmail, you got something that looked like this. 
a different world. We were really young in web development, and I think it's easy to forget the context that that manifesto was written in. So the way that we experience it, I think, um, at least the way that I experience people talking about, about Agile in lots of shops is very different than the manifesto. So you get in this thing where you're supposed to be about individuals and their actions over processes and tools, but instead it's like, oh my god, look at all the shiny tools. We've got Vagrant, we've got Docker, we've got Behat, we've got Grunt, we've got Chef, we've got Jenkins, we've got Ansible, we've got Tra Travis, we've got what stuff? Like, where, how do we get there? And working software over comprehensive documentation gets reinterpreted to say, we're agile, documentation is against the rules. We don't have to write it. We're agile. I've heard that. I've seen blog posts about that. The kind of documentation that the manifesto was pushing back against was documentation that looked like this. We're talking about massive amounts of documentation that needed to be written before you could ever start on a project. That kept you from getting the kind of feedback that you needed about whether what you were doing was even a good idea. And in their own words, uh, part of this context is that they were pushing back against and tired of being blamed by management um, for failures that they perceived, developers perceived as managerial failures. So as they described every day, marketing or management or external customers, internal customers, and yes, even developers don't want to make the hard trade-offs. They don't want to make the decision, so they impose irrational demands through the imposition of corporate power structures. And this isn't merely a software development problem, but it runs through Dilbert-esque organizations. And I think it runs to an extent through open source. The more that we see people depending on open source for their bottom line, we start to see some of those irrational impositions of structure as well. So, yeah, documentation. You're agile. You can document. It's okay. And the reaction against the structure often – oh, this is still you. Sorry. Yeah, it is. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation is the next step in this. So after you've done your big document and you said this is what we're going to do, we negotiate that contract and you're locked into it. And so they're saying we want to collaborate with our customers, and yet I don't see agile shops necessarily implementing this. Certainly there are exceptions, but I've had so many where it looks like this. And whether the bid is from internal resources or whether it's a client, we had to give this fixed estimate, this bid, or we wouldn't get the job or we wouldn't be able to do the things we needed to do, followed by scope creep, we don't want to collaborate with you, not at all. Scope creep, stop, we, we're going to do what we wrote down. At the same time that they're talking about being agile. And oftentimes this uh, reaction against the imposition of structures goes so far as to saying, like, we don't need to actually plan. It's like, man, Fuck it, planning is boring, let's shred the code. And as our great war leader and president, Dwight Eisenhower, informed us, plans, in fact, are useless, but planning is essential. And it's actually kind of a wise way of looking at it. Like, you, you make a plan, and then reality intrudes, and your plan inevitably must be, to some extent, chuffed or scrapped or rethought. But if you didn't take the time to get together with your team and think about the work that you were going to do together, the exercise of planning, you're just going to like agile yourself into some massive cluster. It's, it's inevitable. And yet, I have seen the light, right? I have seen teams where every commit that they make to a repository is run against a battery of quick and rapid and valuable tests that inform developers if they have caused a regression in some other part of the code unintentionally. I have seen pre-deployment tests that actually functionally burn down and smoke test every single function of the site. They run unit tests. They run lints. They run acceptance tests. They do cross-browser testing, all run by robots, and that's amazing, right? That is the kind of thing that helps you get out of this world of fearing to deploy because you're flying blind. Right? Automation, and especially automation coupled with appropriate testing, gives you a sense of telemetry on your projects. Right? You get to know, you have some sense of assurance what's going to happen before it goes into production. Like, who here has ever had something only happen in production? Right? That is the worst feeling ever. Nobody ever wants to experience that again. And, and this is the way we as an industry advance ourselves towards escaping that kind of trap, escaping that fear, because fear in the words of Frank Herbert and Dune, is the mind killer. It will destroy your brain, and so you have to get away from it as much as possible. Um, I think even beyond fear, um, 
automation can help us get out of the, the, the realm of our job where it feels like we're just digging a ditch. Sometimes web development is a bit like you're digging a ditch. You're just like doing the work, putting it in, cranking it out, getting the things done. And if we didn't have computers to augment ourselves and make us more effective in doing what we do, I don't think many of us would actually be in this job. Like, I started out my career as a, as a kid um, just being like an HTML jockey. And if I didn't have, like, grep and find a place and other things that would automate my manipulation of all these documents, I would never, I would have washed out immediately. Because the idea that you would, like, go in and literally change every character with a text editor, that is ditch digging. And nobody wants to be a ditch digger. Um, and, and the worst of all possible worlds is sometimes when you have inappropriate automation or not very well done automation and... It's supposed to keep you from flying blind. It's supposed to give you this sense of assurance and can prevent, you know, human error from crapping out in production. But the automation feels like it's digging a ditch, too. Like, you kind of have to fight with your automation system in order to get anything done. And what happens then is people will start to circumvent the process. They'll go around the ditch, or they'll, they'll like, find excuses not to do it. And you'll end up in the worst possible worlds where you put in the effort at some point, somebody put in the effort to set up a, an automation testing regime, but then it was too hard to use, so people went around it, and then there was a bug in deployment, and now everyone's angry. And part of this leads to a common perception of developers as daredevils, as people who don't want to follow rules, who want to do what they want to do, and not really play along with the system. And I, I've gotten this both from shops and within the community that we want to make sure that, that we're careful because we don't want to put barriers to contribution or we don't want to stick QA between the developers and getting their code to places, which I think is a little bit crazy and actually not like my experience working with developers. It's like this, this mythos that exists around it. Um, I've been doing some narrative research collecting stories about people's experience collaborating and deploying with software. And when asked after telling a story about a deployment, what would you change if you could go back and change something? Overwhelmingly, putting safeguards in place and planning better were the things that a mostly developer audience said that they would change if they could go back and do it over. And so while there's that daredevil mythos that I see, I feel like deployments actually feel a little bit more like this than the mountain bike jumping, that you get ready to get that stuff to production, and you could use a guardrail here. It would be okay. Nobody's going to complain if they can keep their truck on the road and they can keep going. So I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, specific examples that, um, that I think are, are, are pretty informative from, from my direct experience. Uh, so I've uh, uh, worked with uh, the development team at Tableau. Tableau is like a big software company. They make some amazing badass analytics tools that you can run all kinds of big data through. And they have like hundreds of engineers on staff working on their analytics suite. They also have a really sophisticated website that like talks about like all the like hundreds of thousands of different ways that analytics and big data can help you. And if you Google Tableau or big data plus almost anything, they've got a dedicated landing page for that. And that actually takes you through a dedicated flow that like will connect you to the right people and hopefully eventually sell you their software. They have like a team of five people who just, developers, real developers who work inside their marketing department and just work on that website. And they were in that terrible flying blind place. Um, and uh, Eric Peterson, I'll, we'll put a link up to this in the, um, uh, the DrupalCon LA page at the end. He has a great deck about their, what he calls their continuous integration renaissance. And they went from a place where they were only testing at the, really seriously testing at the end of the sprint, which meant that at the end of the sprint, there was all the inter integration problems would crop up and everyone would get demoralized because they couldn't deploy. They didn't have an environment for testing that actually represented production. So they would get tests that passed in their testing environment and then did not work the same way in production. And uh, they had, a, like, this eventually led the whole team to kind of feel like morale was at an all time low because they had, like, so many sprints, like, seemed to go well and then like crash and burn because they couldn't get it integrated or worse, they deployed stuff into production and they had a fire drill to roll it back or do a hot fix. And over the course of about six months, they put in the discipline to say, we're going to start building robust tests. We're going to get environments to test in that represent production really well. And we're going to start doing this automatically on every commit. 
Um, and they don't run all the tests on every commit, but they run a battery of, of like the good tests on every commit. And what that means is developers find out right away if there's an unintended consequence. And before they go live, they do like a really, really full battery of tests. And they've really managed to cut down on almost completely eliminating wonky things happening only in production. They had to give up some stuff for that. One of the things that they had to give up was um, the ability for someone with Drupal administrative interface experience to like quick fix something in the live environment. Right. That was something originally that attracted them to Drupal because it's very empowering to be like, oh yeah, the live site just needs this extra sidebar. Put click on, I just did it, fulfilled that request. And that's really cool, except at this scale where you have a really complex site and there's a lot of things going on that like click, click, solves the problem on this page, might have created a problem on another page. And so they had to kind of sacrifice the Drupal's like a immediate gratification, quick fix capability, but because they were able to put all of this automation in line, they were able to get deploys going quick enough that they feel like at the end it was like really worth the trade-off and they don't want to go back. So that, that is a place that you can realistically get to if you want. Another example I like is uh, from my, uh, my homeboys at Gizra. They're a really uh, high quality shop. Um, they do a lot of interesting stuff with Drupal. And one of the most interesting things I think they do is they follow what they call, quote, the Gizra way. And there's a couple of good blog posts on this and a video where Amitai kind of like rants about it for 45 minutes. You can watch. But what it boils down to is they were fed up with what I like to call the Jenga school of web development. I, I think we've all been here at one point or another. It's where like you're working on the site and you're getting it all together and it's like perfect and now we're just never going to touch it again and then it's like, oh, uh, what do I do? I've got to rebuild that. Um, and that the process of actually kind of like, you know, it starts with, as Dries mentioned in this keynote, like where, where do you start? You start out live coding on Drupal.org, right? <laughs> and that is the, the epitome of Jenga style development because you have no repetitive process to get to where you were. You're really, you're creating something that's kind of inherently unstable through a, a series of non-deterministic steps. So what they do is they actually build everything up to be automated and built in an automated fashion from the beginning. It starts with a, with a uh, make file, goes to an installation profile, whatever content they need to migrate, there's a script for that, so that when they sit down to start work on any given Sunday, they can blow away their entire environment, run one command, and in five minutes have the site built up to the point where it's currently built in that environment. And so what it does to their workflow is at the front end of a project, it's slower and more expensive. But then as they start to show things to the client, and as the client has epiphanies seeing a running website and wants to make changes, they're in a much better position to adjust because they don't have to suddenly reverse engineer whatever got them to where they were. They can kind of take their recipe back a few steps and head off in a new direction. It's a very powerful way to think about building, like actually the, the work of development, not just testing and deployment, can be augmented through automation in ways that are very effective. And lastly, of course, there are cautionary tales. I've seen um, a project that, uh, that I worked on earlier in my career where, you know, it was a big publishing project and there were like four shops involved and a big internal team. So there's like 15, almost 20 people working on this project. And that was creating like workflow problems and it was like, we're going to get this with testing and we're going to have this huge like push around testing. And uh, I think it's partly because the tools in the ecosystem weren't as mature at the time. We didn't have the right like methods for doing really truly effective testing that we'll talk about in a bit. But I, I think in retrospect that more people hours were spent building this uh, like kind of like overbuilt but also at the same time kind of rickety test system and then keeping it the care and feeding of the tests themselves became a bigger engineering effort than the actual website. There's kind of like the way in which you can have the automation boondoggle take on a life of its own, which is obviously something we want to avoid. That's why I like to emphasize what I like to call appropriate automation. So there are so many things that can go wrong automating. And Josh is talking about big system automation, but at its very, I, I, at the core of Drupal, we have a simple automation thing that we take for granted, I think, called cron. And in the process of collecting those stories, I was reminded about the role that cron plays in Drupal development. There was this fantastic story about a shop that had built a site for a client that had been in production for six months, and they were getting ready to bring it back and introduce some new features. So they got the, they d deployed the code to the test server, and they brought the production database back, and they were testing their work, and they went home on Friday, and this was a site with a lot of user interaction, blogs and forums and organic groups. And when they came into work on, on Monday, they got the email that the server had sent out 23 million emails over the weekend, all of which pointed to the test server. 
because it hadn't been running on production. Very simple, very easy thing to miss. That's one of the places where there are safeguards and things that matter. And I think this brings up something really important about automation that we're going to talk more about as we build on this, which is automation is great, but automation also just does what you tell it to, and it doesn't account for meaning and value. So I question the value of those 23 million emails. A website that was in production for six months with 50,000 users, 23 million emails, and no one noticed probably means they did not want those emails. And so we have this built-in automation with the thing that we click together with Jenga and we say, yeah, sure, we're going to tell everybody about everything. And we are not actually focusing on the value of what we're automating and what it means to the people that we're interacting with. So all of the things that we can automate those notifications, maybe not the best idea. And so in getting started, we have to think about what matters and what drives value, as well as lightening the load of repetitive tasks. Both of those matter, but I really like to focus on the value piece of it. So there are things you can do. You can have documentation that will be automatically compiled from comments in your code, the automated notifications, representative environments, unit tests, all of these things exist. And you can move from manual testing to recorded browser tests to abstracted browser tests. All of that's a choice. So where are you going to start and what are you going to do? And I think Drupal is in an interesting place here because received wisdom for frameworks and um, people who are doing agile development have you start with unit testing with code that you can test so that developers know that it's doing what they think it should be doing. But Drupal doesn't do that. The promise of Drupal, and at least the promise for me when I started, and I think for a lot of people who are new to Drupal, is that you can take things and you can piece them together without a lot of developer intervention. And the value doesn't actually come or live in the business layer necessarily of something that you've coded and tested. It lives in these interacting modules. And so you move up from the unit testing and the integration testing, and ideally you're going to have end-to-end -end tests, things that might be, I'm going to talk about behavior-driven development and BHAT. Um, if you haven't heard of it before, it's a way of describing in plain language um, what a website's supposed to do, and that's all about discovering meaning and value, and that's something you're supposed to be doing with your business development team. But what happens, and what I did when I first saw it, is we were so desperate to be able to automate some of that end-to-end -end testing is the only way we could know that the site was going to be right, that I ended up with tests that look more like this one. So I wanted to describe it in language with these pre-built steps and be able to capture that clicked together value that I didn't know how to test any other way. So I have this like basic feature that I'm describing that I want to contribute content, so as an author I need to log in. And the first scenario is to be successful and given a user named Virginia and the author, and you just don't even want to read that. <laughs> like, the point, if this is to foster, this language is to foster conversation, it doesn't do that. It's not serving its main most valuable purpose. But I still did it and I still found use in it, I think it serves as an exoskeleton in a way for a Drupal site to help hold it up while you're figuring out better ways of doing things. But eventually, you end up molting that test suite. That exoskeleton has to change in order for you to grow with what you learn and what you can do better. And I think this comes up to the question of like, what is truly valuable testing for websites? And you know, there are unit tests in core and unit tests in contrib modules, which are highly effective if you're looking to refactor core or make a patch to a contributed module. They will tell you almost nothing about whether the website you are assembling from the composition of all those is working the way you intended or not. You have to move up to some kind of outside-in behavioral driven testing for this. And the, the challenge sometimes is as we are, are early in our learning about this as a community, um, those types of tests that you said, like you don't even want to read it. Do you imagine um, a, a spec or a test suite for a site? It could include hundreds of tests that are written out like that. And when I look at those things, it reminds me of earlier times in my career when someone would say, like, here's the Photoshop document. Now, just make the web page. Go, go get it. Go, make it look, no, see, it's, it's a little bit off. You've got to make it like the Photoshop doc. Um, everybody's probably had that experience before. And it's not to say that having the Photoshop doc wasn't actually
actually a necessary part of the process because without some idea of where you're going, you're going to have a hard time building it. But as a specification for a website, kind of didactic, deterministic, um, sort of dictatorial uh, specifications like that or like a series of tests that list out, list out every single step in kind of asinine detail are fundamentally, maybe they're useful as a kind of a point in inspection exoskeleton. They're unhelpful to the process. They don't really help us in the long haul improve our lives and make things better. You want, we want our automation, we want our testing to be like an actual skeleton, a backbone for what we do so that as we invest in building systems for automation, no matter what kind of life the uh, website takes on as it's built around it, it re retains a lot of its validity. And, you know, you'll probably have to throw some things out and recycle some stuff, but the, the sort of first-generation behavioral testing, which is very exoskeleton-ish in its feeling, um, is something that we maybe we all have to go through, but we should try to think about how to move beyond. Yeah, and it happens the most when you're trying to introduce uh, some kind of end-to-end -end testing to an existing site because you're, you're not doing discovery at that point. If anything, you're, you're backfilling documentation. And so it's so easy to do. Um, but a scenario like that is probably going to read more like given I'm logged in and you're going to focus on what the authors are contributing and what the value of the website is and that's just going to become a, a small step in the process and something that isn't actually locked to the user experience directly. So I've been really interested lately um, by some work coming out of the jobs to be done people, especially Alan Clement. Um, rethinking this idea of the user story. Um, in in BHAT, that format is, and, and for Agile forever, it's, it's one of two ways of phrasing it, but it's in order to do something of value as a particular role or persona, I need to be able to accomplish something. And for me, that's always felt a little bit like ill-fitting clothes. It made a lot of sense, and this is one of the points that they make, when we didn't have easy access to our users, and we didn't have the opportunity to be networked and to talk to them about the experiences they were having. And it was really important for developers, and, and this came out in Dries's keynote, actually, too, to remember there were actually people using the product that you were building as a software engineer but they don't really capture everything that you need to know if you're creating value. So these folks would say that the persona is irrelevant. And what they want to do, we make a lot of assumptions at that level. We don't know that it's necessarily the best action. So the, an expected outcome, yeah, there's probably that. And so that piece they save, but they redefine this with the idea that we need to pay attention to users' motivations. So, for example, I was having a conversation with someone yesterday who was talking about how they do oncolo uh, an oncology website and the people who are using their services are not just one person finding out information. There are physicians, there are caregivers, and there are people who have been diagnosed. And even someone who's been diagnosed with cancer is at a very different place when they first receive that diagnosis, when they start their treatment, and when they're in their treatment, and that the persona captures none of this. So they suggest that you focus more on the situation. What are the people feeling, and what is their motivation? So what this does if that's what your feature says, instead of in order to create content, I want to log in, we focus on what people are trying to communicate and where that value level comes in, then when, when we're making the hard trade-offs about what we do, we have a guideline that's meaningful to make those hard decisions by. We understand what the impact of the application that we're building is on the people who are using it. So there's a lot more emotion and motivation about what's supposed to be happening for a certain feature. So those wireframes that Josh was talking about, you might get something like this. Um, and we will put the links to the blog post because this also is some of Alan Clement's work. You have this plain old wireframe and you might have received it with some documentation that said what it was supposed to do and you might not have. There might just be all this implicit functionality that wasn't in the bid that you're now expected to implement because somebody filled up some space on the screen to make it look balanced. So you have these things and you don't have that context. So the idea is to provide context and the jobs to be done people would ask you to look at your interface more like this. So in his example, everything here is about what these elements are doing for their users. So why do we have your sales rep at the top? 
Well, you want to remind the customer that Joey is their sales rep because they have anxiety potentially about physically being with the salesperson and, and not being right there. And all of those elements have reasons so that when you can't decide what to do at the theming level or you can't decide what to do about how you implement it, you can think about the state of the user and what it is they're supposed to get out of it. And that will help you drive decisions and decide if the cost of doing something more custom is worthwhile or maybe not as important. So let's talk about actually what we do when we automate. Like if we want to get down to brass tacks and sort of have the rubber meet the road, um, like what are the things that we absolutely need to do that are going to provide real value for our teams, for our processes as part of implementing or enhancing our existing automation suite? Yeah, and I want to suggest, um, and there's definitely research out there to support this and experience, perhaps anecdotally, a lot of it in the room, that it's very difficult to succeed at, at really um, the kind of automation that Josh was describing and even some of the, the more modest efforts if you aren't working as an organization. So if a small group of people decides that it's a really great idea to stop everyone from committing until the tests pass, you're messing with their workflow and that actually has ripple effects all the way through the organization. In addition, like what we saw with the Gizra Way slide, if you're spending time on that automation up front, you're seeing those higher costs you need the support of business units and people, uh, customers in order to understand why that cost is acceptable and what it's going to get you. So deciding to be enthusiastic and say, yes, I can do this by yourself is a risky endeavor. And that, I, I think it's easy to forget that. I know I've forgotten that at times um, to lay that groundwork and to make sure that what's happening is what we, we want to be doing. Yeah, everyone's on the same page. But so, assuming you can get your organizational buy-in, the next thing you need to do is make sure that your version control is on straight. And everybody should be using version control, and if you're not, you are bad and you should feel bad. Um, <laughs> And, and the reason for this is not just that you have the, like, the ability to roll back and keep track of things, and that's how we all do stuff as professionals. The reason is that version control creates a system of checkpoints around your work, and that is actually the fundamental backbone for any meaningful automation system. Anything you're going to do that's going to do cool stuff with automation is going to be linked to, triggered by, keying off of, and making use of version control. So if you've been putting it off, I don't think any people in the room have been, but if you're watching this online and you haven't really gotten version control, yet this is another reason to do it. It's not that painful. You won't ever want to go back and, uh, and then you know, the next time someone gives a talk like that, you can kind of smile smugly to yourself that you're doing it correctly. Well, to be fair, it, it might be that painful if you came in and you came in with the idea that you're going to click the things together That's and you're true. suddenly confronted with Git and the command line. But I, I maintain the pain is worth it. Yeah. So the next thing you'll need in order to automate is something to orchestrate your automation. Um, I see people get started with things early on and they kind of try to have the website automate itself um, in terms of the development process. And this is always a bad idea. You don't want to go into like automation inception where a system is trying to affect itself in some way while it's running. That's going to inevitably lead to all kinds of weird edge cases and be inherently fragile. There are a lot of wonderful tools out there for doing orchestration around automation. Uh, the undisputed heavyweight champion on the open source side is a tool called uh, Jenkins. It's a wonderful Java project that you can install and set up. And if you are looking to get your feet wet with this type of stuff, there are also a number of free services that will do it. And they'll actually do it in perpetuity for open source projects. So you can use Travis, you can use CircleCI, you can use Worker. There's probably like five, four or five more because it, it's a hot space and a lot of things are popping up all the time. But the point is you need to make a choice about who is the kind of this dude over there. You've got the version control, but somebody's going to have to like wave the wand around and conduct the orchestration of automation. And you shouldn't, like, uh, I wouldn't torture yourself with this choice too much. It can become a bit of an imponderable. Just pick something that seems good, time box your, your, uh, your research to an hour or so, and then move forward. Um, and be ready to change in the future because a lot of what you built will be reusable. And lastly, it's up to you. It's up to you to do the automation. The automation doesn't automate itself yet. It's actually pretty dumb. All the things that we'll do are, are not very inherently intelligent. You will have to think, 
about what you want, what steps in your workflow you want to make automated, which things you want to happen on the basis of the script, and if you're going to be doing um, uh, uh, testing, useful testing for websites, which our example does, you need to think about what's worth testing and why. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But basically, pick your, get your version control ready, pick your orchestrator, and then kind of dive in. And you got to do some development work. You should make clear some time to do this, clear some time to learn a bit about it. It'll be time well spent, I promise. So we have a non-live demo that I will step through, an example of how you might actually do workflow automation. And we're going to start with a pull request. Um, I use GitHub as my example because GitHub is uh, freely available to everyone and it makes using Git pretty easy. And they have a nice, simple workflow. I see a lot of people out there, um, who here is familiar with GitFlow? Right? Who here actually uses GitFlow? <coughs> Surprising number of people. I find GitFlow to be um, like baroquely overcomplicated for website development. And it's because it was developed by people who kind of release binary uh, applications and you need to support multiple versions. So there's a lot of stuff in there that's like, you don't have multiple versions of your website running at once that you need to support. And the, the, the basic Git, uh, GitHub workflow of create a branch, work on the branch, review the branch, and merge the branch is actually what I think 99% of websites really need. You can go with that kind of simpler, less easy, less, less likely to screw yourself up kind of workflow and it gets the job done. And in here, we've got um, uh, Travis CI implemented so that as I've opened my pull request, it just says, oh, you think you should merge this back to master? Let's see about that. And uh, it's going to go ahead and uh, spin that up automatically, and it'll run. It orchestrates the running of all the tests. And in this case, I'm actually testing. The website isn't run on Travis. Travis is just orchestrating the, um, the uh, implementation of the representative environment and uh, that we know is very close to the production environment because that's not something Travis is able to do for you. But it can orchestrate everything for you and then trigger a battery of tests against it. And if you go to the next slide, yeah. And so in this case, I'm using the BHAT uh, tool suite to do a very simple test. Um, and it's just checking to make sure that the home page still loads and has the right content on it. Um, and so this is the type of thing where you could add, you know, five or six of these, and it would take you a matter of, you know, an hour or so. The, the repo where I made all this is open, and you can fork it and hack it and kind of get your own version going. And the point is that you don't need to start with automation as, like, a, a, a moonshot kind of Apollo-style project. You can start with something that tests the four or five most important things on your website and maybe does a little bit of linting and maybe does some like, other quick static analysis and just like let it run in the background every time you make a pull request. And then I guarantee you within the first week it's going to come back with like, whoops, something failed. And you just saved yourself like more time than you probably spent setting that up because you won't have to go back and reload the process of where you were in the project at the time. You'll know right then and there that something was wrong and you have to fix it. Um, so this is the, uh, the structure of a BHAT test in the, uh, written in the, uh, the Gherkin syntax, which is kind of like, you know, the homepage title. Given that I'm on the homepage, then I should see the homepage title. And this is kind of an example of, uh, of how the syntax works. And there's value in this a little bit, I think, because this is inherently very hackable, right? You, you know, you, you're not really, like, capturing any business value in this type of language, as Melissa was talking about. But if you have some tests in your repo like this, it's super, super easy for somebody to just copy it, paste it, and write another scenario that's also important. And it can be a way to introduce this notion of testing. You know, you're going to tend yourself towards that exoskeleton style, but it's a, a way to get started with a low barrier to entry. Um, and you don't need to do that, though. As a developer, behavioral testing is, is actually that, that, old, old, that English language layer is an additional library on top of the core browser extraction library, which is called Mink. And this lets you just write tests directly in code, kind of similar to how you might write a unit test, except it's designed to be a behavioral test. And so, for instance, in this case, it's like saying, hey, let's go ahead and like, uh, make sure that we can make nodes. And that's cool. And if I had a website with 10 different node types, I could, rather than having 10 instances of that, have an array and iterate through 10 things and then test my 10 nodes really easily as a developer to create that. It gives you the ability to kind of rapidly create those sort of point inspection style uh, behavioral tests that can provide value and, and kind of help you avoid regressions when, you know, you're working over here with this config module, but, oh, it did a hook menu that you weren't expecting and something else broke and that you weren't actually looking directly at. The other thing that you can do with Mink that's really valuable, yeah, this is, this is good, um, is uh, you can create your own behavioral definitions. So Gherkin, um, I use the pickled Gherkin because any picture of a pickle on its own is just inappropriate to put in the slide. Um, you can create your own Gherkin definitions, which means that you can describe behavior that is of value to your website, and people can write and use those, like your own verbs, your own scenarios, and that can actually have very complex 
um, uh, definitions in Mink as to what all that means. So this idea of scenario, I'm a logged in user, could actually have a whole bunch of steps in, in there in Mink, but you don't burden the kind of front end text written, written sort of facing side of things with all the laborious didactic definition like that, uh, like that example that uh, Melissa showed before. And in fact, the people who originally developed this style of testing and the syntaxes, which comes out of the Ruby community uh, project called Cucumber, they, four years ago, they've been at this for a while, they decided to um, unilaterally and somewhat controversially remove all of the default step definitions from their library. Um, the library is called Cucumber, and they said, uh, what we're seeing is people are just writing these kind of stupid tests that don't really mean anything. Like, as a P person who wants to write a page, I need to write a page so that there's a page. That's like, it's just the, mo the least, that's, there's no meaning in that. That's like completely senseless. And so they said, what we're going to do is we're going to take away all of the things from the library that had the, as I'm on this page, I should see all these kind of inbuilt step definitions that people have been using to create these somewhat useless tests. And like, they're still available as another library that they called Training Wheels. But their point was, if that's what you want to test, don't write it in English, because it doesn't matter. Just write a quick like, lower level code test. Think about what the things that you would, write in, would want to write in English. And there's probably a small number of tests that might correspond with conversations you've had with your stakeholders or your clients about what the freaking purpose of the website is in the first place. And then think about how you can write code that represents those things, and you're building a much more flexible, enduring value uh, test system that you'll be able to continue using for a long time to come. Yeah, if anyone's using the B hat extension, the Drupal extension to B hat, um, the the Drupal driver and the ability to interact with your Drupal site using the API as part of this whole framework was. Um, separated from the core extension so that it exists on its own and it's actually possible for you to uh, use the browser abstraction layer mink without using gherkin at all and the, the rule of thumb for when that's appropriate would be when you're a developer and you're checking on tests for yourself which is absolutely valid there are all sorts of things, especially with that unique position, or not unique, but that particular position that Drupal is in, where as a developer you do want to see that some things are working so that you have confidence, but that's not a conversation that you're going to have with a stakeholder, and that Gherkin is there really about having stakeholder conversations and creating meaning. So if you mix those two together, you can deter from that portion of the, the process that behavior-driven development has, and developers may choose to use those pre-built steps um, and go ahead and keep writing them because it's faster, but they may also prefer just to write the code because it's a thing they need, and they don't need the distraction of trying to figure out how to make something seem like it's meaningful from a client perspective when that's not why they're writing the test. Yeah, you, you just make work for yourself if you're doing that. So the point is uh, you want to use Mink as a browser abstraction layer because it lets you do a bunch of other fun things later, but you don't need to use the, the language. You can just write unit uh, PHP unit style uh, invoked tests that use Mink to test the website from the outside in, which is, again, probably the only meaningful way to test a custom website build. So it passed, right? This is awesome because now uh, I know that my pull request to add the new login logic didn't break the homepage and I can feel much more like empowered about doing this kind of development. And as a developer, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm getting out of this world of flying blind. I'm kind of getting my swagger back a little bit because if you have a good set of tests, you can start like really going out there and getting after it. Like you can take really aggressive changes and you can try to refactor whole systems and you can kind of get back into being like, you know, people say cowboy coding is wrong, but like kind of like you could be a cowboy and, and like, like go out there and run them down and rustle them up and squash those bugs and why actually that's a good question why is it always cowboys and gods and stuff yeah that was part of as we were putting this together I was thinking about the imagery that goes with developers and I, I do think that part of it is just that self-perpetuating idea that developers are, are men and so we have a lot of male imagery about that but I also started to think about those Dilbert-esque organizations and about communication dysfunction. And I wonder if that imagery does not also come from a desire to be in control of things, to be able to make things certain that other people change. And with cowboy imagery, maybe just a little bit of giving up. That idea of, I don't need to be with the team. I'm going to take my horse. I'm going to go. 
I'm going to camp. I'm going to not necessarily have to deal with that. And I think that um, metaphor is really important in how we think about the work that we do. And I love the idea of automation being mechanical. I think that the mechanical movement of code and configuration and database and server settings is great. But I do think that we do a disservice when we think about the meaning and the creation of meaning in that same way. So I am perfectly content to love a mechanical automation metaphor at the same time that websites that I work on are often much more like gardens that require planning. You have to decide where you plant your things. If you live someplace with winter, when the snow comes, that deadline, that one was real, right? And so I think there's a mismatch too between people um, who get those metaphors confused. The thing that helps me the most about that garden metaphor is it reminds me that I can't make a plant grow, not even at gunpoint. So when I'm working on a project, even though often it's my responsibility to see that things turn out on time, what I need to do is create an environment that supports the growth or the production of the things that are supposed to happen. And I can't force a developer to write code on time. I can't force the client to give me the requirements when we thought we needed them. So what I need to do with automation to support me and that whole mechanical backbone is to work on creating that more complex environment. But at the same time, this stuff is just so freaking cool. Um, I, I get really excited about this stuff, and I think that, the, that you all should be really excited about this stuff, and I hope that you are really excited about this stuff, because that enthusiasm, the energy, the hubris, the delusion of thinking that we can actually make our lives better and make our work better is inherently necessary to advance our art and to advance our craft. And just as a final example, why you want to use that, that mink thing rather than like curl or like the built-in flame test. Like, what's the most ditch digging thing you could ever do for testing? Cross-browser regression testing, right? That is the most, like, soul-crushing occupation, and I feel like it's a blight on our, the morality of our craft that we have forced human beings to do this in the past. Because, no, really, think about it. Like, what is more mindless than just, like, loading up different browsers and, like, having the two screens and then, like, writing the email and, like, doing the screenshot with the... Like, that's, that is, like... It's beneath us as human beings. We should not do that work. That is not what we are designed to do. We are, we are people. Um, and so you don't need to. You've got, a, you've got a machine to do that for you. You hook Mink up to like a Selenium grid or a browser stack, and like the same tests that you wrote that are running on your local host that do this thing on every commit, it can run across 70 <laughs> different browsers. It can test it in mobile. It can test it in Opera. It can test it in like obscure versions of IE6, which never work, and you can decide whether you care or not. And that's where you want to get to. And, and hopefully that's the idea of what appropriate automation can do for your project. And um, I, thank you guys for listening. Hopefully there's been some food for thought. Um, this is Melissa. Um, she works at Tag One and project manages and facilitates and does a bunch of amazing things. And this is Josh Koenig. So he's a co-founder of Pantheon and does all kinds of amazing things as well. So you're going to be speaking again today, is that right? Yeah, about headless stuff. But um, we just wanted to thank you for coming. Hopefully yeah. this was at least intriguing and gets the bubbles percolating in your heads. And we're happy to answer any questions. If you have any specifics you're interested in or technical stuff, I can try to answer. Um, but thank you all for attending. Thank you. If there are any questions, there's a microphone right there. Is it on? So I've got a question about um, the evolution of testing with like PHP 3, for instance, because PHP 3 really broke a lot of the existing PHP stuff. And I mean, I've even seen that like the Drupal community hasn't really quite caught up yet. We had workarounds for some of the weird Drupal-y things, like autocomplete. Um, that worked in DHAT too, that I really haven't seen the community come back and, and fix yet. And I think that's a real stumbling block for getting widespread adoption is the way Drupal does some things seems to be more complicated than the average site. The bottom of things is a perfect example. It, it looks really simple from the outside. Testing that is really hard. Can you talk a little bit about those kinds of things and getting that widespread adoption? 
So I know that we did some work at Bad Camp with getting um, the Drupal extension to be had to be more approachable, um, but I don't know personally about what's happening. If you can find Jonathan, if he's here, he would be a terrific person to talk to about how some of those changes have impacted things. Jonathan Hanstrom. Um, the, the other yeah. thing I'll say on this, having spent uh, like uh, an unfortunate number of hours going back and forth with various documentations and trying to figure out which was for which version of BHAT. I think BHAT actually has this problem because they chose mm -hmm. to do like a pretty drastic uh, refactor. There's like, I think there are probably still more people out there using BHAT 2.5 than there are using BHAT 3. So it's kind of like we're in this larger ecosystem challenge. But I will say that like the Drupal extension is a good example and we try to do more with like other uh, working proofs of concept of how to do these things. And that, that is the kind of the challenge for the community to come together on a set of easily replicable standard ways of solving our common problems rather than reinventing the wheel. But we are, I think, unfortunately, it's early days for us. And so the wheel, the first wheel is still probably being finished. And the, the, tr the challenge is, will we recognize it as such when it's done and not start a second one right away? Yeah. Uh, no, you're absolutely right. I just want to give a shout out for the, uh, we have groups at drupal.org slash dhat. Oh, yeah. Uh, everybody, if you're interested in this topic, that's a great place to continue this conversation and find solutions to your problems as you try to implement some of this stuff. Absolutely. Um, one thing I would add, and this isn't specifically with autocompletes and testing those, um, but it is part of the rationale behind the BHAT move to 3.0 was that there were several anti-patterns that had been introduced. Um, things like chaining the English language step definitions that they wanted to remove, although you can still do that and you can kind of training wheels pull that back in, um, that a lot of the, the pain of that change is actually forward looking. Um, but yeah, the lag there is definitely worth acknowledging. Do you want to come up to the microphone? So that way, that way everyone will be able to hear. So that's the, uh, in, in my slides, that's part of the, the, you know, the kid pointing at you. Um, so typically, <laughs> uh, typically the way that'll work is um, if you want to do a really full uh, regression test um, and you've got the tests to do that, what you're going to need to do is get your data and, and if possible all of it, even though if you have a lot of data this might take some time, from production into your representative testing environment. And then you'll need to run, um, depending on how you're doing the, the Drupal development, some people will um, build all of those steps into like an update.php where um, there's a, um, uh, you know, you can have a custom module and like update, every release comes with an update that kind of will go through the steps. Or maybe you are really heavily into features and you just do a, a drush fu um, and, uh, and run that and then trigger your test afterwards. It sort of depends on exactly what you're building. And I will say that if you're, you know, just getting started and it's still early days, um, there's, there's, no, there's no shame in necessarily like having a small amount of manual work to allow an automated test to take place. If you don't have all that scripted, and, but you can take two minutes to set it up and then let the tests run afterwards, that's still better than doing all the tests by hand. Does that sort of answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Sure. I had a quick question about um, your comments about GitFlow. No, 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 no. So, I, yeah, yeah. Um, 
uh, I'm, I'm being a bit provocative when I, when I said that about Git flow. And what you're doing sounds like it makes a ton of sense to me. I'll also say that what you're doing is about 40% of what Git flow tells you you need to do, right? Git flow will explain that you should have actually four concurrent layers of work going on at the same time, which is, I, I just don't actually really see website projects needing all that, and so it sounds like you're using like the appropriate amount of, of branching and so forth. And what I, the reason why I make that comment and, and provocatively about Git flow is I've seen projects go off the rails because they thought they needed to do all of this stuff every time, and then their workflow becomes very convoluted, and the workflow uh, project turns into a boondoggle that's taking up more time than the actual website. So no, I think you're doing exactly the right thing. Just, just to comment on that, I think for us, at first we were looking at it and thinking, oh god, this looks really complicated. And then we sort of realized, oh, really it just means we're branching off of and merging into a different branch than master, like we were before. Yeah. And then the complicated part would come if we ever need to do a hot fix and we have to sort of revert to the manual to figure out how to do all this other four or five layers that you talked about, but we won't do those until 95% of the time. Exactly. Josh, did you just um, So how do you start? How do you start from a mortal and become a golden god? Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I, you might have some. So I, I actually would, would like to have Melissa answer that first because I do think that the um, the social and cultural component of getting this right, in, unless it's just you yourself, the developer, you got to get that right first. Otherwise, you're inevitably going to run into problems. Yeah. So getting started with with the testing um, can begin at that, that unit test level where you're running it as a developer and you don't even have it as part of your infrastructure. Drupal being not super unit testable until hopefully eight, right? And makes that level challenging. So getting set up even as a developer locally before you integrate into any kind of system, um, the checks that you can do is actually a really great way to get that very first piece started. And when we first introduced it when I was working at a company a few years ago now, the developers were actually really excited. So they had not had a QA. That was one of the places where QA got in the way of developers being good at their stuff, so they were supposed to take care of it themselves. Because that always works. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and it didn't really work. And there was a lot of tension between people who were demoing to clients and, and products that weren't finished. It, with the introduction of, of a tool that the developers felt comfortable with that would actually work against the things that they were doing, even if it was that sort of brittle exoskeleton test, it actually let them take responsibility for that work, and they were really excited. And that spread to an organizational level where they decided to go further and say, all right, well, they were using Drush make files, and they had other kinds of automation, and so they brought those together. If that at all gets at it, I mean, that's an example. But um, having the conversations about what is the cost to your organization of the regressions that you're experiencing, what's the cost of, of current difficulties, and what problem are you actually trying to solve, and how will you be able to tell if you solved it, are the, the human side of saying, okay, we do have this problem, we want to make it better, let's try this and being willing to treat it as experimental as part of the organization in order to get started as well. And how you're going to really implement it, I think, depends very much on what problem it is you're trying to solve with the automation. Is it ditch digging? Is it regression? Like, where is the pain point for the work that you're generally doing? And if you can approach it from that aspect, you can get buy-in, and that's going to tell you which tools you should focus on and how to go from there. And I think that uh, from a technical standpoint, you just, like, come up with a list of all the things you could test and stack rank them based on how much work they are and how much value they provide. And like one of the easiest things you can do, even before you get into like behavioral testing, if you're not automatically linting your code um, after, like that's like one of the quickest things you can do. Like a lot of people have that built into, they, if they're using IDEs, there's some amount of that, but like there's Drupal specific linting you can do with like the coder module and other things. And just like 
getting the immediate feedback uh, from a system that I didn't have to set up and run after I was doing something and made a commit that told me, oh, you know, I actually misspelled this thing. And, uh, and I wouldn't have caught that until something else ran. Like, things like that that actually start to, s you get the developers on board with the process because it's saving them time and it's providing them value. The, uh, that's the way that you can kind of build the momentum that will eventually get you to a place where you feel very confident about your deployments and you don't. But it will take time, right? And so the point is that, um, it's, it's a riskier thing if you try to do it as this kind of like a moonshot project where it's like, we're going to do a six-month project to do testing. It should be more like we're going to do a, a, a one-week project to do some testing, and then yeah, that's going to be good, and then we'll do another one-week project to do some more testing. And over six months of doing this and feeling good about it every step of the way, we'll work our way up the ladder to being very confident. It's a process, man. <laughs> and if you're starting in the middle, right, you're going to come full circle. And the less you, if you can do that full circle, especially with, with the, the BHAT type testing where you're focusing on the co uh, stakeholder conversations, if you start with getting some assurances in place and you come full circle, you're going to see your tests at every phase of that cycle in a different light. And that's something I didn't say that I kind of wish I had, is that it's really important to realize that this automation, the failures that you run into, the most important thing about those failures is getting the right feedback to the right people with the power to fix the problem. And if your test is failing because there are new business requirements and your code is fine, and you keep getting information about that or you're testing values that are uh, supposed to be changed in the interface and you're a developer and you're getting that feedback, you're not really going to be interested in it. And so another part of successfully automating is making sure that the right person knows and that you can make it move more swiftly rather than giving noise to people who are trying to do their jobs. I think maybe we have time for one more question, and then I hear the music next door, which probably means we have to release you all. Go ahead. So my question is about like, third parties and other services. Yeah, this is a this is a big challenge, especially where um, you know uh, the the representative environment for testing is really key. Because if you don't get that good representative environment, then your testing is always going to be you know kind of sorta accurate. And um, when you have third party services and they don't have things like a sandbox or a something that you can actually test against, you have to get creative. So one of the things that um, uh, if you're so you're talking about like uh, especially like an API implementation or something like that, one of the things that uh, the techniques that are that are that are best for this and the best services out there will provide some of this for you is you you essentially mock the remote API and what that allows you to do is test it much faster because it actually happens in real time rather than over the network and you don't actually have to do or change anything. Um, we've done a bunch of this internally and it's, uh, it's a little bit of a process but it ends up working out. Now, what that does mean is that your tests assume that the remote service is working and it hasn't changed. That's something you have to kind of like find another <laughs> way to manage but you can still do all those pieces. You just have to create, and that's the technical term, you want to mock for that. So essentially it's going to talk to something that's not really that API but it's going to respond the API would have with that data and that lets you test the full life cycle of the code that you're looking to implement. I think that's all the time we got. I, we can hang out and chat more later, but uh, we'll, we'll release the room. Thank you again for coming, and hopefully you appropriately automate.